Well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Diedrich and, and all the organizers. And if I may, I would like to quickly share one screen, the, uh, one uh, screen. And that is because I really would like to uh, express my gratitude. Uh, writing the book has been a big thing and uh, it would not have been possible uh, without Enzer, who uh, not only are organizing an organized event today, but who really uh, were very instrumental in, in that they initially encouraged me to write the book. And also, um, I guess, provided a, a, a setting or a framework. And what I mean by this is those who know you, and I guess most of you don't, is that I just love to ask questions. And I always ask why, and what if, and what if not. And it just occurred to me um, that, so now I cannot, well, I can't, that there is this one verse that summarizes in, in, in a way the essence of, of science or even of, of humanity, of who we are. And I think this is, at least this is what, what I've, in, in spirit, what I feel was guiding the last few years. Every human being has the right to ask the reason why and to have it answered by themselves. And this, there is all love, all wisdom, all power, as well as abundance. Why I'm saying this now is, is this last few years have been difficult for everyone. And what, what this book about is not to, to ask question why from a state of fear or aggression, but really from this very essence of of I think our own entitlement of who you, we are as human beings. And in this regard, I want to thank Answer, in particular for providing this opportunity uh, to, to do research in a way that perhaps these days is not, cannot be taken for granted. And I definitely also want to ask, uh, express my gratitude to Springer for giving excellent support and supervision in terms of uh, writing the book, what should be added in you know, uh, specific literature to be looked at and things like, like those. And it was uh, during this exchange when they pointed me to some fascinating articles. Uh, two of those, or one of those shaped uh, two of my chapters written by Marco Cosentino. And that's why how I got in, in touch then later. And I'm so glad that he's here today to join us for this event. And um, Diedrich already uh, introduced the speakers. Um, so I'm just wanting to thank them again for taking the time and for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Diedrich. Thank you so much. To all of you, and in particular, of course, to Siguna for uh, the kind uh, mention, but first of all, for uh, her book. And uh, I must say that, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say that I'm very pleased and honored for this invitation to this uh, webinar. And uh, over the last few days, I, I went back through the form that Springer sent me in the, the end of 2021 when, when they asked me to evaluate the first draft of Siguna's book. And, uh, and I went back to my to my feelings and at that time I was so I was so happy. First of all, I was so impressed by the the incredible amount of data and information and of the structure that Siguna already gave to this uh, to this book, which uh, included uh, a lot of issues. Uh, I, I was so happy to find that uh, there was someone uh, around the world that just decided uh, to ask uh, herself more or less the same questions that I was that I was asking to myself and trying to give some very important answers 
about uh, uh, these vaccine products uh, that uh, uh, were already distributed throughout the world. And um, I was already very interested in these products. And uh, in this very short, in this short presentation, I just would like to share some of the reasons why uh, although I'm a clinical pharmacologist, uh, I was from the very beginning very much interested in the in the nature of uh, and in the effects the potential effects of these vaccines and why of course uh, uh, to me the the book by Siguna came so uh, timely and uh, and so useful in its uh, contents so, so first of all i would like to say that uh, um, these products are quite different from conventional vaccines in as much as, as conventional vaccines usually contain antigens uh, which uh, uh, are responsible for their effects uh, um, uh, which uh, uh, more or less consist just in the stimulation of the immune system and instructing the immune system to, to identify the same antigens uh, in uh, in a subsequent uh, situation, but on the contrary, the mRNA vaccines, which were uh, um, developed uh, to fight against SARS-CoV-2, uh, indeed do contain a molecule which is the mRNA, which uh, uh, is not an antigen uh, and uh, by itself is unable to trigger uh, any antiviral immune response unless it is translated but by endogenous cell metabolism into an active uh, protein, which is the viral S protein, which, which uh, incidentally, it happens uh, to be the, the most active and the most uh, aggressive and toxic uh, protein in the structure of this, uh, uh, of this virus. And uh, uh, I think that most of us, maybe all of us, are quite familiar with this kind of, uh, of schemes. I would like to to drive your attention just on two or three points in this uh, figure. So first of all, these vaccines, as you, you see here on the upper left side of this, uh, of this uh, cartoon, contain an, an RNA which penetrates into the cell. This RNA is translated. So the first point is there is a, um, a stranger uh, RNA. Uh, which penetrates in the cells and thereafter is translated into a, into this spike protein, which can be first expressed on the surface of the cells, second can be secreted uh, outside of the cells, either contained in exosomes or just as uh, uh, as free uh, protein. Uh, one additional thing is that this cell can be in principle any kind of cell in the in the body since there is no uh, targeted system to drive these vaccines towards a pre-specified uh, tissue so in principle any kind of tissue in the in the body any kind of organ any kind of cells could be involved in this uh, in this uh, process from a regulatory point of view, I'm a little bit interested also in the regulation of medicinal uh, of medicines of medicinal drugs. Uh, these are products based on nucleic acids, in particular on RNA. This is a a, a very nice uh, review which was recently published in Frontiers in in Medicine, which revises in general the uh, regulatory issues related to uh, RNA-based uh, drugs. And uh, in this scheme in particular, the, the boxes, uh, uh, the shaded boxes indicate uh, uh, in which kind of uh, medicines these RNA-based drugs could be categorized. Of course, RNA-based drugs are mostly, uh, and first of all, biological medicinal products. They, in general, are categorized as advanced therapy medicinal products, and in particular as gene therapy medicinal products. Unfortunately, the European Medicines Agency decided a few years ago that uh, in the case that RNA-based drugs would be uh, developed to fight against uh, uh, infectious disease, they should not be considered as gene therapy products, but they should be considered as vaccines. But so, and they considered, of course, as vaccines. 
But in, in principle, there is no reason why they should not be considered as a chemical drugs. And in my opinion, it would have been, been absolutely better if they would have been considered as chemical drugs from the very beginning. What does it mean? It means a lot from the regulatory point of view. I will tell you very briefly what I will give you a few examples about what does it mean from the preclinical and clinical point of view and also uh, what, imply, what it, it implies for the post-marketing safety uh, assessment. So first of all, this is uh, uh, just a um, comparison of a couple of paragraphs from the guidelines uh, uh, for the preclinical development uh, of uh, vaccines uh, on the left uh, and for the preclinical development of pharmaceutics that is of chemical drugs on the right. As you can see on the left, vaccines are just expected to be evaluated for immunogenicity, uh, pharmacody pharmacodynamics in general, that is the mechanism of action, is not a matter of interest. And pharmacokinetic studies, that is uh, uh, absorption, distribution, uh, elimination, uh, in general disposition of these products, are normally not needed. Because the idea is that, of course, when you inject the vaccine, there it will remain and it will be cleared very, very quickly. Uh, for pharmaceutical uh, drugs, on the contrary, it's absolutely necessary to perform very careful pharmacodynamic studies, investigating the effects, uh, first of all, for safety reasons uh, on the main uh, organs and, uh, and systems and functions in the, in the body, the cardiovascular, nervous, respiratory system. Uh, there is a, a, a very clear need for a requirement for toxicokinetic and pharmacokinetic studies, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, acute and chronic toxicity, and the genotoxicity, etc. So a lot, a lot of ass uh, assessments, uh, which of course uh, should uh, support later the rational use of these medicines. Uh, which, of course, all these assessments were never done uh, so far for these products, uh, but uh, uh, would uh, uh, this kind of assessments useful and necessary for this RNA vaccine? So in my opinion, of course, the, the answer is yes, because first of all, as you remember, the point was the RNA and the spike protein, which is produced endogenously and thereafter is uh, distributed throughout the body, this S protein, I, I will not speak about the RNA, but of course also the RNA has a lot of uh, has, has a lot of properties, uh, uh, very interesting and a little bit also worrying properties. I will just tell you that uh, the the S protein that we know from the studies on the on the virus has a lot uh, of targets that can be uh, considered as pharmacological targets, uh, which. Uh, um, are targets which mediate uh, the, the the toxic, uh, the pathological effects of this uh, of this protein on the on the various tissues and uh, and organs like uh, like heart, uh, like nervous system, peripheral and central nervous system, endocrine system, uh, endocrine glands, uh, etc. And uh, so a pharmacodynamic, pharmacodynamic, careful pharmacodynamic studies would, uh, would, would be absolutely necessary to understand about the potential effects of these products. But also pharmacokinetic studies. There are a lot of examples in the, in the literature uh, just uh, uh, thanks uh, to the, 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 the spontaneous works of independent researchers. I will just mention this one which was recently published in, uh, in uh, circulation. And uh, uh, this is a, a very nice and clear study which correlates uh, the presence of the spike protein in the, you see free antigen and total antigen, the antigen is the spike protein, the presence of the spike protein in the, in the general circulation of young people. And the spike protein can be uh, identified in young people which experience uh, uh, cardiac inflammations after vaccine, but not, uh, this is the, 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 the red uh, dots, uh, is uh, young people with uh, cardiac inflammation. The blue dots uh, is people without, uh, um, without cardiac inflammation. And you see in particular that uh, in the, for the, the free, the free antigen, uh, you have a lot of spike when you have uh, a cardiac inflammation, but absolutely no, nearly no spike and when you have no inflammation. So of course the most 
the most uh, likely the most likely explanation is that uh, when the spike protein is produced in excess and undergoes a, a systemic disposition of course potentially it may affect uh, any uh, any vulnerable uh, tissue and organs like the like the heart but of course we we know nearly nothing about pharmacodynamics or pharmacokinetics of these products uh, and this uh, this is uh, a very big uh, problem from the clinical point of view just uh, just a few just one uh, one example one 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 point uh, for vaccines, uh, the clinical trials just deal uh, with uh, uh, immunogenicity and protective efficacy, and usually uh, laboratory tests are not necessary. Uh, on the contrary, for chemical drugs, uh, uh, you need to do a lot of uh, uh, hematology, clinical chemistry, urine analysis, uh, etc., uh, during clinical trials just to understand uh, this is crucial for the interpretation of the cell dress events and so to, to establish the, the safety profile of the, of the drug, which was not the case for these products. So, so for instance, we had to discover only, only later, and, uh, and again, just thanks to uh, a, few, a few spontaneous uh, studies, that, for instance, the cardiac damage, this is a study in, it, in 800 uh, 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 healthcare workers in a Swiss uh, hospital who underwent uh, vaccination with uh, RNA uh, vaccines. They just uh, underwent uh, um, blood analysis before and after the vaccines, uh, and it was found that about 2.8% of, uh, of these healthcare workers just experienced increase of troponin uh, in the blood, uh, which is uh, uh, a marker of uh, myocardial inflammation and, uh, and damage. And of course, this should, should help us to identify also people at major, uh, at major risk and more vulnerable to the potential damages of these products. And finally, I will not go through this, this uh, in detail through this final point, because there would be too much to say in this very few time that, uh, that we have, but also, Post-marketing assessment of the safety of, uh, of uh, vaccines uh, uh, profoundly differs from the general post-marketing assessment of chemical drugs. For chemical drugs, we have a very, I mean, guidelines uh, which consider uh, a lot of different uh, uh, effects. On the contrary, for vaccines, we have very strict guidelines uh, which uh, tend to exclude uh, nearly all the possible uh, uh, adverse effects uh, of vaccines because, for instance, they impose um, uh, the, the so-called plausible time window, which is usually very uh, short, and they exclude vaccines as, uh, as a reason for adverse uh, effects. In the case, for instance, there are other possible explanations. So usually they do not consider that vaccines can be, for instance, uh, an additional uh, cause, but just they, for instance, people with previous COVID who after vaccine experience uh, some uh, adverse event, uh, usually the explanation is COVID and not the vaccine. So in, in this way, of course, there is a, it's in some way a very stupid system because you, you will miss most of the, of the information. Recently, there was a, a a nice review paper, which was published in, the, in uh, Drug Safety uh, a couple of months uh, ago, which revised in general the safety assessment, the efficacy and safety assessment in general of conventional vaccines, and suggested some, provided some, some good um, indications uh, to change uh, uh, this uh, system for, uh, for vaccines, for instance, suggesting for the efficacy not to evaluate only the, the, sp the specific infectious disease, but also to evaluate in general overall morbidity and, uh, and mortality, and to continue, for instance, a blinded follow-up of vaccinated and controlled subjects for at least 12 months. Remember that for, uh, for RNA vaccines and in general for COVID-19 vaccines, we had just a follow-up of about one uh, in on average one month and a half just because we had to move at the speed of science just as as someone uh, told and for the safety it's very interesting they suggest uh, 
to perform active uh, pharmacovigilance and not just passive pharmacovigilance like uh, is the, the usual rule now. Unfortunately, they do not uh, uh, mention the need also to study the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics of vaccine products, uh, maybe because they just refer in general to conventional vaccines, uh, not to this novel uh, to these novel platforms. So, um, in general, for all, all the, there are, uh, I hope that I was I was able to show you that uh, uh, these new products, uh, these brand new products, which come from a biotechnological platform, which was developed for gene therapy purposes, uh, uh, just pose a lot of new uh, challenges, uh, which were so far. Uh, never considered, and, and that's why, in, in my opinion, the uh, Siguna's book uh, uh, comes uh, uh, absolutely timely, and at present it represents uh, the best uh, reference and uh, uh, unique example of its uh, of of this kind. The best reference that anyone interested in understanding the true nature of these products. Uh, uh, with the purpose to use safely uh, or to understand to what extent these products can be safely uh, used in the clinical uh, practice, anyone, I mean, should uh, should uh, refer to this uh, to this book and its content. And for this reason, I would like to thank again Siguna for uh, her uh, incredible, wonderful uh, work. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marco, for this thorough pharmacological assessment of the book and comments on the testing of vaccines. I would like to pass the word immediately to the next speaker, Dr. Angelika Hilbeck of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Angelika, are you ready? Thank you very much for um, passing the word to me, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And finally, welcome the birth of this, this wonderful book uh, to the world. Um, I am not going to talk much about the science. There is others who are way more competent in doing this. But I thought I, I spend a few remarks on the process and some of the background, how this book came about. Um, the book was a long time in the making and is a, a clear testament not only of the science that has emerged over the past few years, which Marco has already alluded to, and I'm sure Zaguna will still do so, but it's also a testament to the rigor and the dedication of Dr. Miller to, ex Miller, Miller to examine uh, to excruciating detail um, the metrics and molecular reactions and the 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 details of what all, all processes that go into this entire activity and process of, of vaccination and production of vaccination, and take apart also the logic and the premises behind all of that. And she looked at all data and evidence that came out and popped up everywhere very quickly and in quite high frequency uh, during the pandemic times when it was in full swing, which almost amounted to a superhuman um, endeavor that we were always stunned with what energy and effort she would not stop short of, of rigor, regardless how many of the new studies came out. So I think it was almost a superhuman um, effort that she invested in this. And testament to that is also the long list of references. And uh, Dr. Miller, I know, we know she not only read them all, but she examined them all with the data in it and the premises they contained. Um, and what struck us, and I'll speak in a moment about who is us, um, was that when looking around uh, during those, those pandemic times, um, we did not see this degree of rigorous, inquisitive, relentless analysis without, you know, with, with cold and non-partisan approach uh, to this anywhere uh, in, in the many expert commissions that popped up around us. Every country had all of a sudden lots of expert commissions and experts came and, and advised governments, etc. And we were 
at least expecting that that is the level of quality we would expect and see elsewhere so that we could compare um, findings, uh, thoughts, debates, et cetera. And we didn't see that. So the level and the degree of, of detailed examination of rigor that uh, Dr. Miller applied to the analysis of the data that came out were unmatched in my in our view, and we were looking we were looking for those um, other expert groups, and we were looking for the rigor and what 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 came out and what takes they were. What we did find instead actually was that we had in in many of the expert commission foremost scientists that were fully embedded with the politics and operated in close coordination with the politics. Hence, the policy and regulatory steps that were taken by our governments were mostly shaped by a handful of selected, highly specialized experts with a lot of depth in narrow disciplines, but little breadth. And it took, and that is what our analysis, we were part of a group that uh, Siguna has, has indicated, and certainly what shaped and, and um, went and assisted also Siguna in her analysis, that breadth we were missing in most of the um, expert groups that we were following very closely of what, what they said, did, and what the basis of their analysis constituted. So the book is, and I indicated it uh, in these statements, is also a testament of a group of scientists with a broad spectrum of disciplines that we considered all relevant to the uh, pandemic, who gathered at the beginning of the pandemic and had decided very quickly because the events were like uh, within hours they took place and have decided not to run with the politicization and the weaponization of virtually all aspects of the pandemic during its shaping and formative moments, certainly in the beginning of, of the pandemic. We quickly realized that there is a tornado out there and created and decided to create a safe space for free and critical inquiry and debate without having to take any side or take into consideration any of the politicization and weaponization. And also to protect us from the viciousness that ensued within the days and hours as the news of the pandemic broke. It was a breathtaking speed at which all of these things started to happen and evolve. And we found that no segment of society was left untouched by toxic debates, broke out everywhere, divided societies, divided families, friends, collegial circles. So rational, critical, and unbiased scientific debate weighing all evidence and possible interpretations of the data independently, regardless of the political, economical, and whatever gains became impossible. And we found we needed a space where we can do this. So this was um, um, to, to many of us also a shocking realization, um, how, how this unfolded very, very quickly. And um, we felt very fortunate and very grateful that we could find the space amongst ourselves. So that's also a value of having a group like ENSA and, and its sister organizations that offer that space for, for keeping calm, keeping rational, keeping to the focus in cat catastrophic times. Okay, so that 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 is also clear. So um, I think Dr. Miller was was one of the most calm and rigorous thinker among us, but we were we were privileged to share that space with her. We had the privilege to be educated and informed by Dr. Miller's analysis. And we had the intellectual pleasure also to engage with her and other colleagues of that group in uncountable hours of inquisitive and very deep scientific debate, which is what we love to do. And it is a great joy and fulfillment, fulfillment for us who then encouraged Dr. Miller to use this enormous effort and all the findings and insights she accumulated over the time to finally put this down on the record and we with great pride we also um now are celebrating the launch of the book and that the book sees the light of the day um i just wish to finish up my remarks um 
that as many as possible benefit from this huge amount of work. And I also wish that it might help or, you know, assist in developing for the next catastrophe coming up, um, be this uh, a pandemic or other health and medical emergency issues, that one day we may live in a world where those who have been bestowed by us with the power of governing in our societies would learn to understand that in particular in times of crisis and catastrophe, you need critical thinkers and scientists with a broad diversity of expertise to deal with any catastrophe and not to go after them or force them into cover or submission and not voice their understanding of how these issues ensued and how the contributing factors um, have been shaped to it. Because I think it is this that we need in catastrophe to avoid misery and, and harm to people. So thank you, Siguna, um, for this fabulous book. I have it. So just that you know, um, I have not completely read it, I must admit, but I am, I'm close. <laughs> okay, so, but I'm <laughs> part of the discussion group and it shaped my thinking enormously and educated my understanding of these things. As an agroecologist, this is not naturally my field. Thank you very much, Siguna, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angelica. It is very important for everyone to be aware of the scientific perspective in which this book came about and these vaccines came about, um, the scientific perspective in which um, Corona rolled off into the world. I'd like to ask the next speaker immediately to take the screen, and that's Dr. Ulrich Löning, biologist formerly of the University of Edinburgh, in particular of the Center for Human Ecology. Ulrich, please, the screen is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I approach this uh, in, with two hats um, from a long time ago. I was a molecular biologist. I worked indeed on RNA, its synthesis in the nucleus, uh, and in particular, uh, the ribosomal RNA and the way it's processed and so on. Um, and actually, I was the first, I think, uh, to detect messenger RNA in a eukaryote, pea seedlings, um, in 1962. Uh, that shows how old I am. Um, having come back from that great conference of biochemists in Moscow, where Jacob announced what became the Jacob Monod messenger RNA idea. And um, one of the first things my lab did uh, was to see if we could find such a molecule in, in pea seedlings. And we, we found it and we published it in Nature. And um, th that was a great finding. But like all science, it was wrong. We didn't find the messenger. We actually, looking back, found nuclear heterogeneous RNA. It wasn't in the cytoplasm. And later, therefore, that experience showed how much more complicated is the whole RNA scheme than meets the eye. And that is the lesson that came into this COVID situation and the arrogance of the vaccine manufacturer that they think they can do this one thing, make a messenger, and that is the answer. And it's that critical attitude in the whole group of people that um, Angelica Hilberg has just described um, that was central to launching the idea that we need a critical analysis of the whole scene of how and why the vaccines work and whether they do indeed work and whether they have no other effect. And the no other effect is the other side of my career. Um, as uh, Diedrich mentioned, um, I became director of the Center for Human Ecology. My interest in the way that humans interact with the environment is very central to the way that the vaccines were developed. Um, the, one of the main principles of human ecology is that you can never do merely one thing. 
And here was a vaccine trying to do one thing, namely uh, create antibodies. And even in the measurement of the antibodies, there seemed to be um, an insufficiency of data. Uh, we relied not on the cellular response, but on the um, soluble protein response. The test for whether the antibodies worked were uh, blood antibodies, uh, IgG, IgA, and so on, and not um, the innate cellular immune response, which early on we all discussed seems to be the first um, major scene of attack against the virus by the body. It's not the long-term immune response as evoked by vaccines, but the immediate innate um, response of killer cells against, um, uh, against the virus. So I'm, I've changed, I, I had a whole script to read out. I've changed all that because of what has been said already. Most of um, what was said uh, um, is, is great, but it's, uh, I have a different attitude there. And it's this double attitude of critically looking at the science of the RNA um, and looking at it from the ecological point of view, that it always has more effects than meets the eye. Um, there's another thing that comes into the book, which explicitly Siguna Muller says uh, she did not want to discuss, which is the origin of the virus. But we did discuss it a lot. And for instance, um, I, like uh, Angelica, I've read most of it, um, leaving out, I think, a bit of chapters eight and nine. There are 13 chapters. It's a mammoth work. And one wonders how on earth a single person could ever have written it. Um, that's the achievement. Um, leaving that out, I was struck by how uh, Siguna picked out um, very accurately, I think, that Moderna patented a sequence of nucleotides, 19 long, which doesn't sound very exciting, but which contained the 12 nucleotides that code for the furin cleavage site, the amino acids which are cleaved when the virus enters the cell, in order to enter the cell, indeed, that cleaved the spike protein has to be split. And that was patented in 2016 or 17. It's not quite clear, actually, whether, uh, when, which year it was, but 16 or 17, well before the COVID um, started, before the pandemic started. And one wonders how it is that of all coronaviruses, this was new to me, that sequence of 12 nucleotides within the 19 patented, um, that sequence is peculiar. A virus that the SARS-CoV-2 virus that caused the pandemic. No other coronaviruses, that's new to me, has that sequence. The nearest um, was published is a, a, a virus in Laos, which is identical to our virus, except for that sequence. So really, this is conclusive evidence that it did not come from a wild animal, to me. But that's not part of the book. It's just an aside. But reading the book, one gets that feeling all the way through. There's more around every corner, like this example I've given, uh, that needs to be explored. Um, I'll just look at my notes for a moment. Um, okay, and the other thing, of course, that has been content contentious um, throughout has been the side effects. You can never do merely one thing, so the vaccine must be doing more things than what you intend. And what are those side effects? We call them side effects because we happen not to want them. We want the effects. But uh, they're, no, they're no more side than any other effect. They're just there. And 
I couldn't understand and still don't, but that's me. Um, the mathematics of distinguishing um, the, uh, what do we call them, uh, absolute and relative efficiencies of the virus. Uh, one comes out at near 90%, um, calculated the other way, and you have only 1%. Um, it's a bit that I do not understand, but Siguna has thoroughly explained it. It's me, my stupidity uh, in not being able to do that. It's fine. The book is full of things of that nature. In particular, early on, the way that that simple story, I started with my own experience with RNA, the simple story has become so complex um, in the last 20 years. Every few years since those early days of messenger RNA, both the nature of what DNA does and the nature of its product, RNA, have had surprises. And to us, surprises, because our imaginations are too narrow. Um, every year, every two or three years, there have been major surprises, and things that were dogma have been upset. And here is another one. So I think the, the whole background to, to this book, which Angelica outlined nicely, um, is, really, um, it is really huge. So one asks, this should be, could have been a work of a multi-author book. I don't know how one person, Siguna Muller, could have put that all together in such a comprehensive and readable way. I say readable, it's all completely readable, but of course, unless you are intrigued by the detail, it is the general conclusions that are the important ones. Now, without being in any way a medic, I cannot do um, what uh, we heard earlier just now, um, I think all medics who promote and administer the vaccines and are, deal with the COVID cases uh, in, on a routine basis um, should read all of the detail of the book. It should be part of our education about how vaccines are and are not successful. But I'd want to add a final point. Um, isn't it amazing, not only that one person, Siguna Muller, has managed to bring off such a mammoth piece of work um, successfully, but it is and seems to be that that sort of thinking that I've described is on the fringe of our scientific biological endeavors. We're not really um, in, in the mainstream in that. Um, the group that ENSA represents is on the fringe of the scientific community. It should be part of the mainstream. It is the central issue that matters, social and environmental responsibility. And the vaccine and the, the pandemic generally have shown the lack of that responsibility among the dominant uh, scientific community. So um, being on the fringe, I think we need to bring this to the mainstream. And I hope this book will help to do just that, that it will show that thinking of, from, of the individual and of a small group um, is a valuable way uh, to further the science of biology general, and in this case, the vaccines in particular. So I think I'll end there um, and, uh, and hope that a book like this gets into the mainstream of medical thinking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ulrich. I'm so happy that we may profit of your long lifespan, which produced this bird's eye view on the book. And the bird's eye view is not just white, of course, but birds also have very sharp eyes. Thank you for your sharp comments. And we can immediately 
pick up your final call on medics to take the book seriously because our last speaker, apart from Siguna, of course, is Dr. Polixeni Nikolopoulou Stamati, who is a medic, a medic. She is an environmental pathologist. And I'd like to give the word to her. Nani, please. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody being here this morning. Uh, I have the privilege and the honor to chair ANSWER. And uh, actually, my part on this book was just to tell Siguna, keep walking, keep walking, Siguna. Uh, Siguna was not looking for witches. She was looking only for angels. She wanted people to understand what this is about, uh, what is happening. Because, you know, the actually, we must admit that the medical world, the medical practitioners, are totally ignorant of the new techniques. Uh, actually, they are expecting some information from the pharmaceutical companies or whatever, because it was an urgent need to, of course, to uh, do something with the pandemic. And of course this happened. And I don't believe that there are people who want to do something wrong. Uh, it was everybody who was looking and trying to see the best way to do it. Uh, of course, we must say that, and we must admit that uh, we can say that we medicals are ignorant on the subject. Uh, I never heard about mRNA vaccines or, or mRNAs uh, or uh, the movement, what, what is happening in the cell. What I was interested in is to how to see the cell turning from a normal cell to cancer cell. And I was looking as a pathologist on this. Uh, so there's not a lot of knowledge there. It's only, uh, let's say, uh, a procedure that takes you uh, trying to identify things and then you don't know where to look for them. So this book is actually built by a Siguna, structured as a ladder. So you climb it step by step and you understand exactly what it means. The human body is a complex such a complex issue. And it's so difficult, let's say, to see all the feedbacks and all the, uh, uh, what is really happening from one, from the start until the end, on the end point of any uh, action inside the body or if it's administered in, through exposure. So uh, this is a very difficult thing. And I'm sure that uh, this book will provide not only the information, but the way of thinking of going from the simple ways to more complex issues, and then from a multidisciplinary approach, uh, trying to identify links and uh, threads that will, uh, will sh show the way. Uh, I heard uh, Ulrich saying very much what I, I was thinking I should say, and I think Ulrich, thank you for describing exactly the whole picture. And Angelica, also I thank you for uh, saying exactly what ANSWER is. ANSWER is a place where we can have discussions. Uh, and of course, uh, not only discussions, but we're learning also. We are learning and we're also trying to disseminate this knowledge in a way, in a very, very calm and clear way. And I will repeat, Siguna was not looking for witches. She was looking for angels. And this is not an anti-vaxxer book. This is a book that we, everybody would like to learn what are these vaccines for, what are they doing, and what we should try to learn more about them. Uh, I, I, I don't think I have to say more for this. Um, I just want to say thank you, Siguna. Thank you very, very much for doing all this work and listening to my uh, request for keep walking, Siguna, keep walking. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Nicolopoulou. Um, not least the last words to Dr. Siguna Müller. Well, maybe not the last words. I invite the participants again to put comments or questions 
in the Q&A box um, so we can deal with them after Siguna's last words or Siguna's own comments, I shouldn't say, the last words. Um, Siguna, please, the screen is yours. Uh, well, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm very touched by the lovely words. And uh, that was a few times I, I was like tearing up really because um, of, of what was said. And, and uh, I just wish you all know, um, thank you, how much it means to, to hear the heart of a scientist and not only numbers or formulas, but that's really what is driving us as scientists. It's our heart, it's our passion. I'd like to go back to what I uh, said previously, because is this right? Uh, It is really our right as a human being to scrutinize, to ask, to ask why, and not as what we have heard before in, by, by many others, not to point fingers or to find fault or find bitches, or I could use more aggressive words, but really because that's the essence of science, isn't it? It's the essence of who we are to find something beautiful. And I really think in this spirit, and I hope that the book will be a part of this, um, that the many problems we are facing worldwide can be addressed the same way. Um, there, I, I really appreciate the comments by Marco about the introduction of what the technology is about, all the nice words spoken by the others. But before I go on, I think I, I should um, make a short comment to what uh, Ulrich said, just for the record. Um, the, the topic about the viral origin and the sequence that you mentioned, uh, that has been published by someone else. It's just, you know, what I picked up as, as an open problem, because everything that is uh, kind of like, let's say, contested these days, uh, it, it just naturally triggers my, my curiosity and then you always dig deep, deeper and that's pretty much more of an ongoing work what I'm doing, extending and analyzing what other people have done. And of course, as you pointed out, um, there, is, there is always more. And uh, I was pleased to, to hear and see from uh, Marcus' presentations that my book really uh, uncovered a lot of the things that are, you know, in more detail now showing and uh, being confirmed in in uh, in recent publications. So I don't know how long I I have because I prepared way too much clearly because it took about two and a half years to write the book. Um, I will spend I don't know fifteen minutes, twenty minutes. That's fine, Siguna. Please do. Someone stop me uh, because if everyone falls asleep, I wouldn't. I wouldn't notice. But um, just as a as a start, um, Springer has graciously made the PDF of the entire front matter uh, downloadable for free on their webpage, and I encourage everyone to go there to really see uh, what the book is all about, including like. It's more than a typical front matter. It's 28 pages. I really encourage everyone, if you haven't done so yet, and go there and 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 uh, pass it on. And well, okay, on to the book. I just want to give a brief, very brief introduction. As I said, I started working on this in the spring or summer of 2020. So the first part is more talking about the thoughts that I had back then, you know, what was known previously, what had done people done before, and then also the first part covering the first insights that we gathered from the first uh, experience up until, you know, roughly the Delta time. 
um, the chapter one, just a basic introduction. And uh, I, I don't, I'm of course not going into details here, but uh, Marco covered a lot of, you know, what this uh, new technology tries to do is in, and so when I first started looking into this, there was all those um, really great hopes in what, what these vaccines and the new types of vaccines are going to do and why in particular they should not be classified as, as gene therapy. I mean, it's just, it's a genetic approach, but the idea was it doesn't uh, integrate into the host genome. Uh, the mRNA is not mutagenic. Looking at, at you know practical natural mRNA, it's degraded quickly, so that shouldn't be a problem either. And there was a few other uh, things that uh, it quickly stood out initially when I searched to, through literature about what happened um, during the last thirty years prior when those technologies had you know first been uh, invented is from the synthetics construction itself, the, the method, how you use it, that there are some challenges about, you know, excessive immune responses, but, you know, the thought was, well, if you have an immune response, that might actually even be good and things like this. So there, there was a lot of um, uh, expectations in this, in this platform. And chapter two then goes deeper into well, let's say appraising those very first uh, ideas or underlying postulates, and uh, in in uh, you know trying to figure out just even from a logical or you know biochemical or genetic genetic perspective, is you know what's you know how how feasible is this. And I spent quite some time looking into these synthetic platforms and I retro technology uh, transcription technologies to generate the synthetic RNA. And it turns out that, well, you know, it sounds great on paper, but there were in fact some challenges. And you know, getting the right immune response to, to be enough and still not be too much is not that easy. And Surprisingly, it turned out that you just don't always get the mRNA, the messenger RNA. You get some unexpected byproducts, and one of the major ones are double-stranded RNAs, which turned out to be a major source of a, a problem that you know people have been trying to 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 resolve for a number of decades, including you know, mod chemical modifications to it and or purification processes and whatnot. And which actually then and it took us until years later to find out that those actually interfere with the notion that the mRNA quickly gets degraded. And well, this same chapter also, you know, starts to look into one of the core problems into, well, does this mRNA get integrated into the genome or through other ways have some mutagenic propensity. And because I started out, you know, it kind of captured my attention initially, the double stranded RNAs. I, you know, I realized, you know, there, there's some related processes going on, or short RNAs, RNA interference, and so other type of regular processes that are related. And then also there is some something like uh, endogenous reverse transcriptase activities. And so it, it just kind of became clear fairly early on that this thing isn't so easy and obvious as, well, it's clear it's not, you know, it's, it's just all result. So chapter three then goes on to, to envision and you know, this was still kind of really in the pandemic. And even when I went back to reading the book just you know the last few days, I thought it's still fascinating to see how much actually was already in evident as first signals, even during, you know, very initially during the during the rollout of the of the vaccines. And I spent, and this this chapter also spends a lot of time 
talking about mechanisms of if you don't have the anticipated messenger RNA, but you know, short RNAs and how they interfere with natural processes and really the, the very, let's say feasibility. Uh, and you know, I know this might say, sound like a strong, uh, saying something very strong, but you know, a very feasibility of creating genetically modified humans. And you know, of course, there is much more to it than just having you know some genetic material getting into some somatic uh, cells. But there is a lot of theoretical underpinnings. And what I initially did also in this chapter is based on the double stranded RNA framework, which has been much better understood in the context of agricultural. Uh, yeah, actually gene therapy processes to take the same thing over. And even though humans are not, you know, are very unique and we have a very sophisticated immune system, there are concerns that really overlap or extend to, to our case. Uh, chapter four um, then takes those initial challenges that were identified in previous chapters and tries to filter down very clear and precise questions as you know, what's the type of, of research that should be done and, and uh, how to identify this better and you know, turn this, if possible, into something you know, that where the questions and challenges are eliminated or draw lines and say, well, this is what we can do and this is what we cannot do. It's a long chapter. I'm not going to bore you with, well, details, which I, of course, cannot do. Um, but I think because Marco talked about this a little bit before, um, from the European perspective, while previously there had been the understanding or the definition or the decision that this is not a gene therapy uh, process is interestingly in the in, in the year 2020 the US FDA uh, came out with this guidance for industry where they had some very clear characteristics and guidelines how to uh, characterize gene therapy processes and I was digging into those characteristics and you know based on the previously chapters and digging the deeper, it, it has really very strong uh, evidence. It fulfills a lot of those criteria. And so in other words, the, the entire regulatory framework as pointed out by Marco and the entire uh, trials would have been, or I really, we should say it should, should have been different because in essence, um, one can make strong arguments that yes, they are really uh, gene therapies. So chapter five, uh, um, I know that this might sound a little bit uh, not so interesting because it's talking more about the, the, how do you actually evaluate vaccine safety and eff effectiveness? And yes, it has to do with evaluations, with statistics, it has to do with other general questions about from the epidemiological perspective, from basic definitions of reporting and things that unfolded during the pandemic or even how you know who is who, like who is a patient, who and you know, who do you call uh, someone uh, vaccinated? How do you then compare as, as to how many, you know, are protected from the vaccine and whatnot. And those are the famous numbers, 95% versus 1% uh, that Ulrich uh, referred to previously. So if you look at the numbers and what these really mean, um, you know, I think that's it's something worthwhile to really look into this because it's a whole lot of a difference. If, Everyone thinks, you know, we're kind of like 95% protected. Or if in reality, understanding the model behind it, understanding, well, you are 1% protected or less. 
um, chapter six just asked the first questions about, well, is there something like an analog of antimicrobial resistance development? And that was just based on understanding that what came about questions that arose fairly early on is those vaccines are actually what, what is called leaky. They don't really prevent, uh, you know, they don't neutralize the, 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 vi the virus. They don't achieve sterilizing immunity. And so I looked at this chapter just, you know, as sort of like parallels as, you know, what would you generally expect? First, within patients that are immunocompromised and, you know, individual patients, but then also at the, at the population level. And early findings, again, up to Delta. Chapter seven then goes on and um, it's a long chapter. It's based on uh, an idea or a framework developed by Heinemann and collaborators of how to assess risks versus benefits of gene therapy process in agriculture. And I took it over to this very particular setting, uh, which is, I think, a powerful tool to identify really where and what is the, tra the trade-off. And it's not merely talking about numbers. It really brings human factor also at the center. And then you can really see, well, where does it run off? And you know, there are some very specific measurements or notions of what it, what scales something, what scales particular risks more and benefits more, or what is what uh, uh, Heinemann called pseudo scales, which look like generating measurements. I mean, even antibody titer or something like this, but in in, in reality, don't give you the right handle on this. Um, the next chapter goes on to also something that Marco quickly mentioned in his talk, is there are in fact official criteria as how to evaluate uh, adverse events following uh, uh, vaccination or injection, uh, A -A AEFIs, and that's uh, developed by the WHO. And I guess I could work on this the rest of my life. It's a fascinating topic because it talks with causation. And in this case, causation, not only in the biological sciences, which is a really important and difficult field, but also in context of a very new platform where we know nothing about. But in order to evaluate it, you need to know exactly how it works. And you need to have very specific data and you need to have presumptions in order to prove your assumptions. And so it's fairly delicate and uh, um, I don't have time, obviously, to go into this. It's fascinating to also see the challenges that arose during the writing of the book and uh, analyzing this criteria as, you know, how, what unfolded during the, time, during the pandemic, who you actually classify as who is vaccinated and so on and so forth. Uh, if, uh, those products are actually more pharmaceuticals than traditional vaccines. This chapter was to a large de degree motivated by Marcus, very fascinating chapter. It's, uh, I extended to more, more questions and then um, really do those mRNA uh, injections resemble actual vaccines and and I'm not didn't only just look at this from from uh, the current perspective of the current COVID vaccines, but it, for instance, in terms of where they are going, because you know normally a vaccine would just stay in the site of injection. What we mean by learned with the, those products, they pretty much go everywhere in your body, and it turns out that you know there are some previous uh, experimental vaccines already 2017 or so where they uh, analyzed similar, you know, the same problem. So I kind of uh, uh, scrutinized or, uh, you know, analyzed the papers and findings there. Chapter 10, uh, also as Marco said, turned out later. So it is spike <laughs> antigen. It turned out later that this is really one of the most um, toxic parts of the virus. And, um, 
it's a huge, huge topic. Initially, it was very controversial. There is a lot of things that during analyzing what was going on, papers were published, were then retracted, or I wrote the book, and then at, you know, while writing the book, it turned out that some papers were re retracted and I had to you know, dance around and like justify, is this true? And I had to dig deep, deeper and turned out there's very often uh, results that got, interestingly enough, retracted and got rediscovered by someone else or were already known previously in, and so on and so forth. It's, it's a fascinating topic, important topic, unfortunately, because I think therein or is where a lot of the, the toxicity and the adverse problems are being explained. Chapter 11, um, it talks about tolerance development, T cell ex exhaustion, all of this. I have to say, I was proud to see that I'm in good company in this chapter because uh, Fauci and collaborators recently, and was only this year, published uh, an article where they, in essence, uh, you know, summarized, summarized part of my chapter. Um, they admitted that these types of products were a scientific and public health failure. They have some understandings or ideas as to what is going on, why, um, respiratory viruses cannot be, uh, you know, you cannot vaccinate your, your way out through a vaccine that is, uh, you know, distributed systemically and uh, previous uh, issues. I turned this actually, or looked at it from a broader perspective, um, going deeper, not only in, in tolerance development, but also T cell uh, exhaustion and evidence of why these mechanisms that have previously been known for a while from you know, the mucosal immunity um, could be driving the decline of vaccine uh, effectiveness. Well, the last part then would be the Omicron variants. Again, you know, I don't have time, but it's Omicron was an interesting thing. It kind of confirmed a lot of things that I've been building during the book. And then, and there was a little bit of a difference in that, you know, some almost say it is a different, it should be called a different virus altogether. I go into all of this in this chapter. Uh, I do ask the question as to where does Omicron really come from? or generally the development of uh, variants of concern where there is, you know, it's not just because it first showed up in South Africa because, you know, people are traveling globally. You know, there's really some concern or evidence uh, that it could have uh, arisen as, because it is a vaccine uh, escape variant, it could have uh, arisen through uh, the population of vaccinated individuals. So that raises the question then, where do we go from here? How about future variants? And, uh, you know, there is like pretty much two opposing scenarios now that either we're just staying stuck through a phenomenon called immune imprinting, or if we could do something else, you know, the entire thing unfortunately might start all over again. Chapter 13 is more than just a conclusion. I knew I would be out of time here. I just encourage you, if there is only one chapter you want to read, please read chapter 13. It adds a little more than just summarizing it all. And uh, But I did want to add this one final uh, concluding remarks as to, again, the spirit of how I was really encouraging everyone to go forward. And it, I was reminded of this when one of the ladies who I acknowledged in the book and said, well, thank you. She said, I didn't even know I was helping you. And I didn't even know you wrote a book. I said, you still help me. Well, how? Just by sending good thoughts, just by being here, just by being an honest scientist and, you know, just critical thinker. And I think that's summarized by, best by one of these uh, uh, a verse by Bert uh, Spalding. Um, 
Through this silent but far-reaching influence of divine thoughts, all humanity, humanity, in fact, entire universe is benefited and raised by every constructive thought, feeling, and spoken word sent out by you. And you know, this shouldn't be read in a context of of uh, religion or spirituality or you name it. I think the essence here really is that um, constructive uh, thoughts send out, that we send out, I, I don't think we know the power that they have. And I know I've experienced it in this group. And once again, thank you so much for everything. Back to you, Diedrich. Great. Thank you very much, Siguna, for your wisdom, I'd like to say, um, spread out in the book. Um, I see applause in the chat. That's very nice because we can do it aloud. Um, we have a nice question and a comment, actually, in the Q&A box. Uh, I'd like to read both. The first is a comment from Giuseppe Longo. I also want to congratulate Siguna for this fantastic work. The book is balanced, constructs a critical knowledge, tries to answer questions with no arrogance, and stresses the limits of any technique with no sound scientific context. That's an important remark. Thank you for the book and for this event. And then there is a question from Ali Barth, who says, medicine is full of brilliant solutions born from violence. Acupuncture originated through the flaying of slaves in ancient China, I didn't know that. Neurosurgery was born in Nazi concentration camps. Do you envisage a useful development for mRNA technology as new vaccine that can justify what is happening? Thank you. I think Siguna is the first one to answer to that, but the other speakers are also allowed to give their views on that. Siguna. I am still trying to see if I can actually understand the question. I think MR, I would never throw anything, I would never throw out the baby with the, with the bath water at all. Uh, I think if there's anything we have learned is, is, is the power of the human mind. I think it can do everything. Um, what, just because we have, even if you have a negative result, I think it is really a positive result because you've learned something. And, you know, I, in the book, I go bit more into detail of mRNA vaccines as a one size fits all technology, that's just not how it works. However, if you did the opposite, if you zoomed in into very specific situations, if you have some cancers or whatnot, I can see that if it could do radically the opposite, you know, it's called, we used to call it personalized medicine and turn it into that. But not into, uh, a, you know, with a humble, humble attitude, going forward is saying that every patient is different, not as just as a patient, but every day, depending on a million factors. And, you know, probably the others might want to uh, respond to this. I don't know if they have something else to say. They can, if they want to. I have another question to ask uh, if there's time left. We have a little time left, but if one of the other speakers wants to react, please interrupt me. If not, I'll ask my question. Um, um, was there not a hand raised with a panelist, uh, with a participant at some point? I, I think I saw was. There was, we invited him to uh, ask a question that he hasn't. So okay. I don't know. Wait a minute. Uh, let me check. Just that we don't overlook anything or anybody. No, exactly. Uh, thanks. The hand is still raised, but I don't know what the question is. Um, please write it in the Q&A box. As I, just, I, I think I am only understanding the question now a little bit better. It's a tricky question because if you say, 
we know that a lot of people have been vaccinated with these technologies. And, uh, you know, from, from what was done during the Nazi time is, unfortunately, we know it was done with the intent to learn something, what, you know, Hitler wouldn't want to have done to himself using other people. Tragically, we know that's the case. And I'm not saying where that is was done intentionally right now, but I am saying that there is an enormous knowledge base now. And rather than judging and condemning, I would say we need to go forward and the data need to be come to come to light. People have the data as to you know, who was vaccinated, what are the effects, what are the side effects, you know, all the open questions we're dealing with now. I think as bad as it might have been, there is always, we have the capacity to not stay in, in a negative thing, but to really say, to turn it around. And, you know, all those words, it was not a nasty experiences. Nobody would say that the Nazi, Nazi time and all of this was good. But we all have the capacity to build and go forward. And I hope that the vaccines will, you know, and, and developments will help us do that, to come together. Thank you, Siguna. That's a wise answer to something that's a very difficult question indeed, actually. Um, there's another comment from Thomas Chauvin. Excellent work. Congratulations to you for your work and your heart. Well done, Tom. Um, I'd like to ask one last question, if I may, um, we're just a few minutes late, but not much. Uh, we've been talking about how to classify or categorize these, this new technology. Um, you've mentioned it yourself, others have too. The, the mRNA vaccines you said are not classified as gene therapy for, for several reasons, but of course they cannot be classified as therapy anyway, because vaccines are not therapy, they are prevention of disease. But especially, I think, because they are so novel in all respects, and they're not the only ones. Uh, we had the other two vaccines from AstraZeneca and Janssen or Johnson, uh, who are slightly different, but have remarkable correspondences with the mRNA vaccines. They do work in a similar way, I think you can say to some extent. Um, I suggested calling the mRNA vaccines genetic vaccines, and that applies to these other two type, these other two vaccines as well. They work with DNA instead of mRNA. Formally, your book does not cover that, but um, in how far does your book apply to these two genetic vaccines, if I may call them that, as well? I, I don't think that there is a, a really big overlap. You know, the big thing really is with the with the. Uh, mRNA vaccines, the initial hype, and I need to call it hype because it sounds great when you first hear about this. You you only need to get the foreign material, the mRNA, into the cytosol. You don't need to get into the nucleus. So the entire notion how it was set up is radically different. And yes, you know you need another step to get your genetic uh, elements from the cytosol to somehow interact with the, the other genetic elements of which there are not, they are not only in the, in the nucleus and there is a regular mixing going on and so on and so forth. So for the RNAs, the entire RNA life cycle is more complicated. And of course, it's not all, all explained just by, by the, the central dogma, it's much more complicated. Whereas with the DNA vaccines, you would think that it should be, all those questions don't arise as such. So in other words, a lot of the book deals with stuff that that are non, pretty much considered non-standard because mostly people still hang on, on, on the tradition of, you know, DNA, RNA, and protein finished, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a lot may be said about that, but uh, we cannot do that now. Nini, uh, you have a remark. Uh, yes. Uh, um, hearing and looking at the whole aspect of this uh, presentation, which covered all aspects, I have. Uh, I would propose that uh, 
they should be online sometimes and maybe I don't know who can do that, but uh, I won't say Didrik because Didrik is in front of his vacation, so I don't want to push anything. But we should organize a teaching webinar for people that would like to know more because medical people, I will just uh, say again that they're totally ignorant of the subject. And it's a pity because there are many challenges there and perhaps many opportunities, as is the title of the book. This is only what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Nini. Um, that was a very good suggestion, I think. Um, and I wanted to repeat my remark from the start anyway, that we are indeed considering organizing a webinar on this subject matter in the near future, because it's very, very worthwhile to hear more about it for everyone and to discuss it more with as many people as possible. And that may well take the form of a teaching webinar as Nini has just suggest suggested. I think with, with that, we should put an end to this event. I would like to thank the audience as well as the speakers very much for their contribution. And I would like to join in the huge compliments for, for Siguna in getting this book done and published. It really deserves a big applause. Thank you. And thank you to everyone, therefore. And with that, I would like to close the event. Bye for now. Thank you all. Thank you.